And Sato's Place is brought to you by... Triple threat, musical stud, superstar in the house. We got a brand new ITL. You're at the place. It's Pensado's place. Hey, guys. Uh, I'm excited about our guest today. We're going to have a lot of fun, learn a lot. Um, I, I'm just happier when I got great musicians in the building. It's just yeah, absolutely. It's, it's fun, just it's fun to have talent at that level sitting yeah. around. Yeah, and plus somebody we've known for a long time. Yeah, and respected forever. Absolutely. Um, how was your week? It was good. Um, things have been good in Pensado Land. I, you know, I, <laughs> there's the only way to say it, right? We are we continue to take this blessing that they've given us and try to shape it and do more with it. It's we need to change the name of the show to Trial Week's Place. No, it went, like when you say Pensado Land or. Pensadian, it just, that's just so not me, you know what I'm saying? It's Will like, and I secretly shot a trollic <laughs> pilot. It didn't go that well, so we're sticking with this one. <laughs> Should we get on with it? Yeah, I, I heard it did well around the res among the rescued animal set, though. Rescued animals and Canadians. I mean, I, I said that about the way you said triple threat. <laughs> <laughs> that's true, you, you did. didn't think that was going to slide I, by, I know, I know, you had to catch it. We'll, we'll have Will clean it up. Let's move forward and get on Don't to our show. Don't clean it up, Will. It's a 20 unit for you. <laughs> <laughs> well, as usual, guys, we're coming to you from the Art Institute of California, Los Angeles. Yes. Thank you for joining us. We are in our HD studio, which Dave normally calls... Herb and Dave. Herb and Dave studio. There you go. Get to our Pensados.tv website for all the information you may please, need. Please do. Obviously, Facebook and Twitter are our friends and yours as well. Get to our YouTube channel. We'll be happy to communicate with you. Always good to see you there. Say hello to our Vintage King friends. What's hey. up, Vintage King? Always good to see them. Jeff Leibovich is in the chat room. Do you have a Stump the Chat Room guy? I question? do. What I is do. it? I uh, do. Ask Jeff what slew rate is and how does it affect the sound of something. And uh, part B, uh, do tubes slew at a slower rate than transistors, solid state products? Ooh, What's the one. difference in sound? By the way, uh, last week, Will and JJP got a chance to take the winners from the House of Rock uh -huh. uh, promotion through the tour. Uh -huh. Apparently went really well. JJP, as usual, was incredible. Spent a lot of time with them. Did philosophy and theory with oh, them, sat down, had a discussion. Will told me it was incredible. So congratulations, too. And these were folks, there were some folks who won who couldn't make it. These were people who Can couldn't make it. One? Of course. Steve out of Ireland, uh, I actually Skyped him and talked to him kind of like as, as a way distant consolation to the tour. Very cool. And a uh, real cool cat. Very cool. So to Nick Blomberg, Chad Wilson, David Font, Kyle McCanley, and Rick Juarez, congratulations. We are happy to do that. Great job, Vintage King. Great job, Blue Mile. All kinds of folks who got involved, and certainly JJP, and you, my friend. Now on to our buddies at Avid. We like our Avid guys. Good things in store coming from our Avid friends. We, we, uh, we enjoy them and thank them for Absolutely. that. Why don't you introduce our ITL? I've got a two-part series coming for you guys. Um, there's a lot of ways to learn this profession. Uh, one of the better ones is through schools like AI, Full Sail, Berkeley, uh, Lars. But I didn't have that route and available to me, so I just taught myself how to engineer. There's a couple of things I did that, that, that helped me and turned out pretty good. There's a lot of things I did that set me back. I'm sharing a couple of things with you that really kind of helped me learn how to identify frequencies as sound. Now, there's probably better ways to do this. This is just my way. Hope you get something from it. Let me know what you think. Hey, guys. I, um, I was just thinking, and I was trying to remember when I first started trying to teach myself frequencies and how to pick out frequencies, what they sounded like, and I remembered how, how my mom used to teach me via ear training. She would, um, she would play like an interval on a piano, and so, so, so she would go. And I'd go, well, that's a fifth, Mom. And then she'd go, that's a fourth. And so I started thinking uh, when I was first learning, what kind of exercise can I make up that will teach me frequencies faster because um, I just didn't have time. I was older when I started engineering than most guys. 
And I just, I just couldn't give up, you know, 10 years learning this stuff, four for school and then another four to get my career going as it was. It took, took me like seven or eight years just to, just to start earning a decent living. So anyway, I came up with some ideas that worked for me. I'm not passing these off as the definitive ear training course by no means. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you some examples from uh, a song that Bob Power mixed for The Roots. I can't remember the name of the song, but it's like five, six, seven years ago. To illustrate some of these techniques, I'm gonna use two songs. Uh, a, a Roots song from an album about five or six years ago that Bob Power, one of my favorite mixers did. Incredible low end, goes all the way down to battery. And then uh, another one by Andy Wallace, who's one of my favorite mixers and people uh, on a Velvet uh, revolver song that he did. I think this is on the first Velvet Revolver album. Now if you look at the screen, uh, I've got two real-time analyzers. The one on the lower left is the classic one from Waves that most of you have. Um, excellent. I thought it might be a little hard to see on your smartphone, so I'm, I'm also using another one by Isotope. It's just set up as, a, as an analyzer just to make it a little easier to see. And now up here I've got you know what? I still get confused, guys, with high pass and low pass. I got a high pass filter, and let's let's start. Let's play a little piece of the song, and, and let's 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 focus. Let's concentrate. As I take the high frequencies away, I'm going to show you a couple of things to listen for. thing that's interesting we're like around one and a half K now where we stop a lot of good mid-range information now I'm not going to cover mid-range in this part and the in the next part which will focus mostly on high end I want you guys to use these techniques and do that yourself and then you know go to our Facebook page and discuss it with each other now I'm going to bring it on down watch when I get to four and five hundred it sounds like that's low end you would think the low end would be lower, but it's not. It's the, the low end information that your brain perceives as low end starts a lot higher than we think. Check this out. Now that's 500. Let's do the kick drum. Okay, now as I, as I hit the bypass button, don't listen to anything. Train your ear to hear only the kick drum. Two things are readily apparent. How much everything above 500 allows you to find the kick drum in the mix. And the other thing that's readily apparent to me is how frequencies in the 500 area actually contribute to my perception of low end. So let's take it on down and see what we got. The reason I stopped here is this is the frequency that a lot of times you manipulate to try and get too low in uh, pieces of information to coexist in the track. So you can call it mud, you can call it whatever you want, but uh, um, uh, we're, what we're trying to do is we're trying to train our ear to hear that frequency, but we're trying to hear it based on taking the high frequencies out. In a minute, I'm going to show you how to do it by just isolating different frequencies. Okay, let's go a little lower and see what we got. Now at 100, that's pretty low. The thing that caught my ear was how in tune the drums are at that frequency because tuning on the low frequency is very critical, whereas tuning in the high frequencies isn't quite as critical in terms of percussion and stuff. 
that kick drum is really tuned nicely. But one of the things that's, that, that really kind of took, took me by surprise when I was first learning uh, about frequencies this way is, is how perfectly in tune the great guys put their, their, their low frequency information. High frequencies can fool your ear a little bit. From 10 to from 10K to 20K is an octave, but from uh, 80 cycles to 40 cycles is an octave. That's only 40 cycles in that octave. In the other octave, there's 10,000 cycles. So it, it takes special equipment to work in those little two and three cycle ranges when you get that low. It's a great way to train your ears to what you're hearing. Now, let's go on down and see what we can hear. On, on the NS10s, they, they're not supposed to go very low, but Trust me, in this room, you, you'll, I can hear it. I'm going to go down to where I can't hear it on my NS10s anymore. I'm down to 60 cycles, and you can hear 60 cycles pretty clear on those, can't you, Will? Yep. Same thing on the, on the, on the little R-tone, same thing on your laptop. You can hear a lot lower than you think. It's just that the frequencies just above it are, are kind of blocking it out. But if you train your ear to hear 60 cycles, 5, 6 dB below where you hear 200 cycles, you can train your ear to hear flat. <laughs> You're not hearing flat, but you can train your ear to, to listen that way. And, and so when we're using smaller speakers, that's a technique we use to, to, to allow ourselves to EQ low frequencies on smaller speakers. Let me go over that again because it's an important point. When I'm listening to my NS10s, I'm EQing 60 cycles and 40 cycles. Now, I can't hear it at zero, let's say imaginary zero. I hear it at 5, 6, 7 dB lower. But because I've memorized what it sounds like at that level, I can EQ it in. I don't need a flat room and flat speakers to work. Uh, several of my friends taught me this. Craig Burbage, Jason Joshua, among others, has uh, really helped me understand this concept. Our guest, there's so many hyphenates about him, but, but the reality of it is is that he's just a stomp down soul man. Wouldn't Absolutely. you think so? Absolutely. If you know him personally, you call him Ray. You guys will know him as Raphael Sadiq. And let's, Dave and I, welcome you to our set, man. What's going on, my man? Good to have you here. Good brother. to be here. Absolutely. It was great, right, man? Man, Raphael is, uh, we were talking earlier, Raphael is just one of those cats that uh, I listen to his records and learn how to be a better engineer. Yeah, a lot of people do. He's <laughs> talked me off the cliff a few times, too. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a few projects as well, too. Life throws you some up and downs and threw him quite a few curveballs. But, I mean, as dark as he, he'll get on a song, he always comes out positive. Man, thank you so much for being here. Raphael, explain to me. Uh, this concept of um, uh, the soul revival, uh, uh, technically, when did that start? Did that start during, for you, did it become evident during your Tony, Tony, Tony days or back as a solo artist? I think it started just... Um, or did it ever start? I mean, no, I didn't start. I just think it's just, you know, just from listening to records growing up, and I think that's all I thought it was. Mm -hmm. And I just sort of came into an industry that was already... Uh, championed by so many great artists and musicians and mm -hmm. I thought they were the great the greater things on earth so I always like yeah. to say I follow like uh, I follow not just the champions just the great the, the people that just touch me and that's what touched me so I thought when I got into the in industry this is what I'm supposed to do you know mm -hmm. I thought this was it so it just has happened that way, it's just natural. It's worked pretty well so far. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think so. <laughs> when I first heard Feels Good back when you were out, you and your brother and cousin were doing the Tony, Tony, Tony thing, um, I, I, that was just one of those seminal songs. Remember her? Yeah, I mean, because you were part of the same label. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think I got my copy from Herb, and that's all I listened to for like four or five years. Herb was encouraging me to produce and write, so I did. Feels good, part 27, part 34. <laughs> when I got up to part 100, Herb encouraged me to focus on my engineering yeah, career. Yeah, why don't you try mixing? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what, that movement, that movement uh, has given us yourself in, in, in some great solo records. Amy Winehouse could be considered as coming out of that movement. Adele. Right. Um, uh, Joss Stone. Joss, uh, whose, whose, whose record he produced. Uh, Mayor Hawthorne. 
a lot of great, a lot of great, great artists. Um, when you sit down to create, I'm fascinated by your mind because I've just never seen a person that can do so many things so well. Did, did you pattern yourself after Prince? Can you tell the story about Prince? Um, well, no, I just pattern myself after. In terms of trying to do everything yourself? No, not at all. I just, I just like in, uh, I don't know, in my house, man, and all my friends play instruments. So, you know, my kids are, you just want to, everybody want to play with everybody else's toys. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my friend Tim, who was at Tony, mm -hmm. he played organ and piano. Nobody knows he, he's a B3 player. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, he's a great B3 player. So like in, at church, you know, I would jump on drums while he played organ. Huh. We didn't have a bass player there. So I would, you know, not play the bass. I didn't even bring the bass to church. Oh, so yeah. at home, the house was, you know, bass, guitar, and drums. Me and Dwayne, Dwayne like, let me see the bass. Let me see the guitar. So it just kind of happened. And it's like that now my nephews, Dwayne's kids, mm -hmm. they're the same way. They come to my studio now and they just, let me see this, let me see Fair. that. So, and the Prince thing, I think, um, I played with Sheila when I was like like 19, well, right out of high school, and I went on that the parade tour with Prince. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know much about Prince. I had heard one of his records, and um, I met him. He's really nice, really cool. And then I found out he played these instruments. But it was pretty much normal. And, and then what I liked about Prince because he was really intrigued by the Oakland movement, which was Sly and the Family Stone and, yeah. and, and Larry Graham. Yeah. And so I, I was in the same, I was too. So I think I was more intrigued by Sly and, and, and Larry more than I was with Prince. But anybody who played a guitar, I was in love with. Mm. From B.B. King to Albert Collins, you know, if you had a guitar, I was like telling everybody like, I'm glad guitar players, musicians were pretty cool because if you had a guitar when I was a kid and you, you at your door like having, hey, I got a guitar, I would run in your house just to play with you. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that musicians were like really cool people when I was growing up. Yeah. I remember back in the day and, um, I was working on a record, um, well, two records come to mind, and then, and then we'll get to the present real quick, but um, I was working on uh, the Jason lyrics, Jason's lyrics song, uh, You Will Know, right, uh, right, Black Man yeah. United. And I'm sitting there struggling, I gotta have it in New York, and, and you walked in and I'm, you saw me struggling. I'm enhancing the story, so go along with me, man. And, uh, <laughs> and I, needed, I didn't have a bass part, D'Angelo hadn't put a bass line on it yet, neither did Brian McKnight, and you, you came in I didn't know you that well at the time. That was the first time I'd met you in person. You just grabbed just some old bass line around and that's the part on the record. That record did like a million singles in a week or two. <laughs> and that's you playing bass, man. Yeah. You saved my ass. And I was like, I was like, that 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 solidified my opinion well, of you at that point. I really in time. didn't want to sing on that record. Ah. You know, I didn't want to be a part of the community choir. Right. And you know, I'm a bass player. Mm -hmm. So singing is like secondary for me. So I was like I disagree, but go ahead. I saw a bass and I was like, it wasn't no bass. I was like, cool, I get to play. Maybe it can show me, just shoot me just playing. And it, mm -hmm. that happened. Exactly right. I mean, we just, yeah. we just threw a line straight in the board. And I, I don't think I even punched you in maybe two, two spots. And yeah. You'd never really heard the song before, I guess. Yeah, I was like, impressed, my friend. <laughs> and then, uh, then they thought Tevin Campbell, of all people, was like, I'm not going there. But anyway, <laughs> then fast forward, I mixed another song. It was, it was, you, Dwayne, and your dad. You remember yeah, that? Yeah, just like my, just like my papa was called. Yeah. 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 I had a hard time. That was such an emotional moment for me. Uh, yeah, my, I guess that was my first time. Well, only time that I, I sang with my father. Is that right? Yeah. But it points out that your whole family was musical. Yeah. Like, I didn't even know that my father was going to be in that record. I got a phone call. It's like, you know, dad's on this record, and we on this record. You, you need to get on this record. I was like... You can't say no to that. No, uh -oh. there's no option <laughs> in that request. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Let, let's jump right into the music. When, when a lot of cats that, that wear a lot of ha hats in the studio, uh, producer, artist, musician, <clears throat> I can sometimes feel when they're going from hat to hat to hat. It feels to me like when I listen to your records that, that you don't distinguish between any of the any of the credits you would see on an album. You just you just try to go in and make a great record. If it's a part you need to play, you play it. If it's a part you don't, you don't. If you need to engineer it, you do. If you need to sing it, you do. It's like your records are seamless. They don't, they don't, have, a, they don't have a distinction in, help me hear her, they don't have a distinction in... in um, well, there's no separation in categories. And, yeah. and what I think it speaks to is what he said earlier. You grew up just sort of doing it all. So when you go in to do stuff, whatever has to be done, 
Yeah. You just do. Is that is that fair to say? Yeah, I remember I was in doing a session. I needed this really high part, this girl part, for her name Bonnie Boyer, who passed away. And, mm-hmm. and she didn't show up in time, and I sang the part. And I was like, <laughs> well, that's, you know, a part that I know I could do. So I just, uh, most of the time, I don't pay attention to what I'm doing. I was just going to say You that. just make records. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes I don't even instinctive. know what I'm doing. I just It's just would, instinct, right? Just would don't just... want to embarrass myself. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, that's my motto You're in way life. Past that, my friend. Uh, me or him? Not not you. Oh. <laughs> You're still <laughs> Um on Stone Rolling, which is one of my all-time favorite records. I thought I thought for a minute that um the record before that uh I will see the way I see, way you. I see you. Yeah. I thought that was my favorite record when it came out, but I, I Stone Rolling is, it's a broader record, and and one of the one of the one of the things I like about that record is is the credit should just be by Raphael Sadiq and friends. There's there's now now Chuck, your engineer Brungart, yes. he's an integral part of your team, and yes. and if you're watching Chuck, great job, man. I mean, um, that cat's an asset, and yeah, he can he, do some things you can't do finally, yeah, and, yeah. and and so you need one partner to make a record. And you got a great one, but um, you don't. You don't sit down. Well, let me, let me finish this train of thought. When, when you sit down to make a record, are you take me through the, the creative process? Just pick a song at random. Let's pick um, uh, "Daydreams," one of my favorite songs on Stone Rolling. Can you take me through the creative process? Mm-hmm. That was one of the earlier songs on the record. It went yeah. through some changes. Yeah. You, you, you threw everything yeah. away, started over. Yeah. Take, take me through that process. Well, I think I was I was just, I think I was about to purchase something and I was like, I shouldn't purchase it right, you know, and I just kinda like saying, you know, sometimes people just purchase things anyway and they don't really care about the cost. So really that was the process of that song and I just started singing, I'm living on daydreams, I'm gonna buy me something I can't afford. And the rest just happened. I just I sang it and I sang it to myself one time and it was just like I don't know. It wasn't a process. Mm. You get the mm. lyrics and melodies first, and one one bundle, or well, that part. I'm living on daydreams. That part I did, but I knew I wanted to sound like, you know, Nashville. I wanted to feel like a little bit of uh, Ray Charles and a little bit of Johnny Cash. Mm. That was my whole thing. Johnny Cash and Ray Charles. Robert Randolph, spectacular on that. Yeah, and I was trying to hijack Robert Randolph for like five years, and I finally man, caught him, and I'm like, him. man. He's capable of making a, one of the greatest records ever, and so yeah. far he has, and I apologize, Robert, but your skill level is. Yeah, he's crazy, and I yeah. caught him on a couple gigs, too, played some festivals together, oh, cool. and you know, got him on stage. It was, it was, to play Daydreams live on stage with him just it was crazy. Oh, that's crazy. So now we've got yeah. the song, we've got the lyrics, we've got everything, so now we're, now, what, what what do you commit to tape first to remember and to do, do you do you put down a rough guitar track and a vocal and then you build the song around that? You know, I call three people in, bass, guitar, and drums, and we just count it off like a band and we just say eight bars of this and then we gonna go. Mm. That's the process mm. for me. And so then you're kind of more the filter through which everyone's taste has to has to pass through in order to make it to the record at that point. Right. You know, make the right calls, you know, and um, get people to get you, to get, to not just get me, to get all the, the music that, you know, was before us and the music that I really like. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then, now you've got those tracks. Is there an, a, a separate, like your songs don't sound like they have a lot of overdubs, maybe a, maybe some strings and some small maybe some, parts. Maybe some strings sometime, but for the most part, a song like Daydreams, it, it wasn't much. Robert Randolph was. Uh-huh. The overdubs in the background, vocals that uh, Monet did. She's from the Bay Area, and she did that oh, okay. "Living on Daydreams" part. Yeah. I didn't know she was from the Bay Area. Yeah, she's from the Bay. Yeah. She she's good. I like she's her really a good. lot. Yeah. Are you, are, have you worked with her? A lot. Oh, my man. whole life. Yeah. She's oh, a, really? Yeah, a lot. Love her stuff. So so then at that point in time, you now we've got the song. We've got some overdubs, and and do you go back in and redo any vocals? You you do the background vocals and. You sing your little girly high parts. That's right. That's right. Actually, the the actually your high parts remind me of Prince. Did you get those from him? Because he always has that no, high I mean, part. I never sound that good. No. <laughs> yeah, uh, you do. No, but I, I I think what happened was with Daydreams, I I sang a rough to send the Robert Randolph. Oh, okay. And I end up leaving the rough. I mean, I sang it like in like one pass, like three minutes at the board by myself. I sang it and said, send us to. 
to Robert, and then I ended up using that for I, I never changed it. Okay, you're, that doesn't happen much. Chuck, uh, I read somewhere where Chuck said that uh, your voice likes dynamic microphones, not big expensive microphones. Is he using an, an SM7 on you mostly? Yeah, for SM7. Your and and you got that from Jerry Brown originally, didn't you? Yeah. Yeah, SM7, because my voice is so high, and sometimes it, it's like really tinty, you know. And mm -hmm. So we found that the SM7 is like kind of rounds everything off, and then sometimes I record my own vocals and I distort them a little bit, mm -hmm. which gives it a little, a little bit more gray. And do you pretend like you're trying to do that, or is that the best you can do on the distortion thing? Um, I just did it. It was trial and error. <laughs> that was a joke. Sorry. I know, <laughs> no, really. I did, joke. Like Chuck came in and said, "Dude, it's all distorted, but it, it sounds good." Good enough. Yeah. Good enough. Okay. Um, on, on, on moving down the line, um, it's got my buddy Larry Dunn on it. Yeah. I'm, I'm mixing for Larry today. Wow. And uh, shout out to Larry. Um, um, the guitar on that, is that Wawa Watson? That's Wawa Watson. That's me and Wawa, but Wawa's doing the, the special about that. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he's, yeah. Wow. And he didn't tell me what he was gonna do, so he was playing, and he was like, just like, watch this, you know. <laughs> and at first, I didn't like it. For like two minutes, I didn't like it. And then when it came back around, I was sitting there going like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it. it's yeah. pretty. Um, and then um, I, I want to discuss this song for Herb. Um, is that that's you playing bass, right? And what song? Oh, oh, oh. Go I'm moving down the line. No, go to hell. Yeah, uh, is that me playing bass? No, that's Calvin. Calvin, uh, that's Calvin. It it just reminded me of um, what was the Motown Jameson? James, me, like, yeah, James, James Jameson bass Yeah, that's line. that's Calvin. Calvin Turner, he's from uh, he's from New Orleans. He's a uh, he's one of my secret weapons. You know, if I put my bass down, you got to be like the baddest <laughs> dude. And I so far I only right. used about two or three cats, but Calvin is a. Uh, it just had a feel that was it, it, the, the bass is is, is is the hook in that song. Yeah, it's so so good. But I'm saving the best for last. Ant Fiddler's on that song. Oh my god. Yeah. That takes me way back. It, yeah. That's yeah. Amp, right? That's Amp. Yeah. Well, Amp like actually when I was playing, and Amp was pulling up sounds for me. Uh, yeah. But it's actually a Mellotron. I'm just playing it. Yeah, I wanted to talk to you about. It. Don't don't give that away yet. That's uh, a whole little special question about the Mellotron. <laughs> now. Um, when, you've produced so many big acts, uh, Josh Stone, um, and you work with everybody. Can't remember, so just say everybody. It's easier to say who you didn't work with. You work with so many people. Is it, when you're producing yourself, when I tr would try to do that, all my best parts were on the erase head. I just kept, I can do it better, I can do it better, I can do it better. Then when I produce other people, especially guitar players, I was, I was better at producing them than myself. Are you like that? I mean, do you, do you have a different technique for yourself as opposed to, to some of the other people you've worked with? I don't know. I think sometimes when I'm producing myself, it's, it's a, sometimes it's a little easier, but when I'm producing another artist, I just, I don't really call myself a producer. I just say that I'm in a band. It's easier for me to swallow that I'm just, I'm just a member of a band. Mm -hmm. And that's how I produce other artists. Mm -hmm. So it makes it a lot easier for me. Run that by me again. That, I just act like deep. a member. I like to act like I'm a member of the band, not like I'm your producer. I just like mm -hmm. joined your band. That way, I'm just I'm still working on me, mm -hmm. sort of, you know. Mm -hmm. But if I come in as a producer and I wear the producer hat, and I like to get opinions from the artist, so I just like you know mm -hmm. play a member of the band. So it's, it's collaborative. You want to hear them. You want them to feel comfortable. Yeah, they may not know you. that, right? But but that's the in way my you head, I'm just a member of the band. Like if I, like I'm a member, no doubt. But right. I'm actually the producer. So like with the Tonys, I was really just a member of a, in a band. But I was really producing the records. Mm -hmm. And um, um, oops, was I supposed to say that? That was producing. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. We can edit. <laughs> we can edit that out. Like there won't be any questions. All those will be edited out too. Um, Stone Rolling, it, it's in the grand tradition of Adele, Amy Winehouse, um, uh, like we said earlier, but yet it's, it's so much more than that. Like, like, like there's, 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 there's elements that remind me of, of songs going all the way back to the 50s. I mean, you got, you got one song that's got a surfer guitar part in it, for heaven's right. sakes. Um, 
a young cat starting out that wants to be a Raphael Sadiq, would your advice be to absorb as much music and then sit down and create? Or, or, or because it seems like, like what I like about you is, is your influences and the way you synthesize them into something that's modern. Like you don't take all these influences and synthesize uh, the next Marvin Gaye record. You actually try to go somewhere and take it new. Your records sound very right. new to me. Um, Give, give some advice to a young cat, a young Raphael Sadiq, just starting out, as to how to take your influences and turn those into a career. Yeah, I, I would say, you know, you know, just keep an open mind at all times and listen, listen to all music and, and you know, you know, um, like melody is, is everything, of course, but you, you need to listen to all genres of music, you know, be it country, jazz, funk, R&B, gospel, rock, whatever, hip hop, you know, even the worst hip hop. I mean, you just you just have to know your surroundings to know mm -hmm. what's good and to know what's bad. I mean, some people just you have to. Uh, I always tell people it just matters what whatever you're turned out by when you're a kid. If you grew up like a Menudo, mm -hmm. you know, you may follow that. You know, but if you like the greater musicians, I don't think you know the Tonys. I thought we were good, but we weren't close to Earth, Wind, and Fire. Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe Earth, Wind, and Fire wasn't close to a Duke Ellington but they were somewhere on that family tree. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's like, if I could just be like, if Maurice White could just see me one day and go, hey man, I really like you. I felt like I, I did oh, it. And you got Larry Dunn helping you. That's yeah, you close. know what I mean? So I think for musicians, a younger musician, you just have to, uh, you know, it's a, it's a different time, but you, you just have to know a lot to, to walk in a session with, um, with anybody. Like I work with Tribe Called Quest, mm -hmm. but it's only because they, they were sampling Sliding the Family Stone records. And so I knew we, we had something in common. Yeah. yeah, we had something in common. You know, they were like sampling breakbeats, but you know, I was, I, I know all that music. So I became a, almost a member of Tribe Called Quest because of that. Mm -hmm. I think I could have, I think I could have been see, a member too. I've been I, I think in, in Raphael's case, because when you fast forward, you've got this really enriched career. There's a lot going on with you right now. I mean, you're one of Times 100 Most Influential People, which is an incredible honor. That's amazing. Um, I mean, people like Elton John and Mick Jagger and Steven Tyler, they refer to you as kind of almost their renaissance soul man, and, and they see you as collaborative partners. Like, you're working with Steven on a film or something, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. What's, tell us about that, that and, um, and that experience particularly. It's a, a film by Epic. It's like an animation cartoon, so um, he's a, he's a, this, it's a big band piece. Mm. It's not just like big band, like, you know, almost what, 40 horns and nice. four winds, and, and he's like this, uh, he's like a Cab Calloway character. Oh, nice. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's what it is, and, um, you know, he's a good dude. He just came in and ripped it, you know. He had heard it first, and he came in and just sang it right away. But it's kind of cool, because you get to play with animation. You got all these different things. You get to, you know, add horns to all these different Things in animation, so it's it's different, but it's it's almost one and the same for me because I'm a visual person anyway. So. Right, and and then because you're also doing Black Nativity or something. There was another film you did. Yes, a musical called um, Black Nativity. Um, Casey Lemons is the director. She did Eats by You and Talk mm -hmm. to Me, and um, it's a musical. So we're doing all the music first, and I'm doing that now. I have to be done like tomorrow. Tomorrow. <laughs> and, blame um, it on her. Yeah, I blame, <laughs> I'll blame on her. Maybe it. That's another story. And, um, do you, you know, like the film side? And, and that's it's a different set of chops, yeah. I, I like it. I've always felt like if I was playing music, that you know, you should be able to shoot the ball from everywhere on the court. So I think it's just yeah, all a part I of. I feel it. that. That's a great. Yeah. That's a great line. Yeah, it's, you know, they say you got to be a little older to start doing film. I'm older now, so there I can I do both. You know, because in the artist world, you know, everybody know the record industry is kind of you know, kind of halfway dead a little bit. You know, but I, I, I stay in Europe, you know, six months out of the year. And music is pretty much alive mm -hmm. there and here too. It's just like, it's harder to find it if you want to find cool music. You have to dig through the crates to find it, but um, yeah. TV is fun. Yeah. Um, Herb, Herb mentioned uh, Elton John. I, I, this, 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 this touched me when I read it. I'm actually going to read this for the first time on the show. This is a quote from Elton John. He's talking about the record that came out before Stone Rolling. With the release of The Way I See It, I was blown away. It became al my album of the year, a soul record of the highest quality. And that's, that's when Elton rare. John goes out of his way to say that about it. No doubt about it. But he's become a friend. 
Yeah, yeah, we work, we work together a lot now. He's up. Elton has always been a, a person who championed like you know that music yes, from back from back day. When Absolutely. I when I looking back, see how many people he endorsed and you know and brought into uh, this yeah. industry and let people know about him. Even from from Macy Gray. Yeah, that's, was, that's right. He endorsed that's Macy right. when she was like you know first coming out. And if you just listen to Elton John music, if you not moved by Benny and the Jets or Rock, if you don't understand the soul of those kinds of records, right? Mm -hmm. Because he's always been a guy who loves church. He loves the gospel side yeah. of what goes on in music, and he puts it in in really sophisticated. So I'm not surprised that they're union at all. Tell me what a Mellotron is. Of course I know, but tell me what a Mellotron is. And why you could you probably break it? it down better than me, but it's just it's an instrument. I don't even know when it was created. I've only seen one in my whole life. I have like two, but you know the Beatles used it a lot. I think they're the ones who've known for making it popular, but it was probably a little popular before them. But it's a it's a basically a box with a tape in it, which you know um, strings. Before, and, it came out before samplers, so it, before samplers, so it's, it's like a bunch of little tape recorders on each key. And each key, and you hit it. And it just plays it in the tape rolls, and it stops, pop, and it spins back around. And and the reason you have two is because they never work. They never. Well, mine mine work pretty good. Mine work pretty good. They sound sounds awful at times, but sometimes I need it to sound awful. Wouldn't it Wouldn't it be safe to say that uh, stone rolling couldn't have happened without the Mellotron? It's yeah, true. I I, I I use it because I I wanted to bring the Mellotron into like soul music. That's the only wow. thing I thought that had never been done. True. It true. was like on more European bands, you know, British bands, but it was never done on like really American soil soul music. Like a lot of the indie hip bands, they use it a lot, but nobody from America uses it in like soul music. But like uh, the Neptunes will use it mm -hmm. in pop, yeah. like in their music, but nobody that's playing something like Knock on Wood would use it. One of our good buddies, I don't know if this is true, I think Greg, uh, Algunas, I think he has one, I could be wrong. Mm. But when you started the record, did you, did you, did you plan it around the Mellotron or did it, the, the Mellotron work its way into your vision? No, I bought it before I made the record and I was like, you know, I'm gonna play this on whatever this record's gonna be. Because <laughs> I never know what my record's gonna be. I just go to the studio and go, well, I got a record coming out. So how do you kind of top what you did? I'm sort of going through that right now. With the new record, um, I don't really know what it's going to be. Um, I did like maybe like 17 songs and then I scrapped everything and kept like three, mm -hmm. three things now. So now once I'm done with this movie, I'll start over. And, um, but it's good like to do this movie and I just, uh, I was the MD for the first time, well second time, but first time for Soul Train right. and I did one for I MD, like the ESPYs. Awards once, but oh. the Soul Train one I think gave me a little bit of a spark to go back and finish my album. Oh, I got you. It served as inspiration, kind of. Yes. Because you were playing behind lots of folks yeah. and interacting with a lot. Yeah, as I watched it, it was interesting to watch their reaction to you being a musical director. Like, because there were lots of musical performances and Cedric was doing things. And I saw them, you know, they right. would refer to you and it was right. just an energy. Yeah, that, that was yeah. yeah, it was really cool. Tee up your, uh, tee up your arm for Babbage Boxer, sir. Okay. Let me, get one, let me get one more question in. Uh, this is an unfair engineering question, but um, Stone Rollin' was essentially kind of an in-the-box record, wasn't it? Yeah. That's, that's but, um, incredible. It, it's, I mean, I know you've monitored through, through your 9000, and you also have another SSL at your studio, but to get that kind of vibe, um, and I remember, I remember Chuck said something about using the Massey tape <laughs> plug-in. Uh, I mean, people should listen to that record because holy cow! When they say, when they say analog can't be done in the box, I mean, well, I, the part of the secret is I'm analog. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's the secret. My bass is analog. My fingers are analog. Digital can't turn me digital. Right. That's right. It can't happen. That's a so people come to my man. studio and they always look into my gear. They want to take pictures. They walk around looking at my gear, and I'm like, "You might as well turn around and take a picture of me." Right. <laughs> it's not the gear all the time. <laughs> Plug in me something completely different, right? Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> much less a malt. No question. <laughs> Let's tee up average boxer, guy. You ready for this, my friend? Yeah. All right. Um, acoustic guitar. Um, Taylor. Oh. Um, piano, synth or real? 
Uh, piano all day long. Real one. Real piano. Yeah. Okay. Regularly, like Yamaha, something like that. There you go. Uh, strings. Oh. Violins. I like violins. I almost was a violin player. Uh, your instrument, real bass. When I say bass, what comes to mind? Uh, 60, 62P bass. 62P bass. I'm writing this down. Taking notes, Herb, taking notes. Uh, let's throw you a curveball. Snare drums. Mm. A lug wig. 69 snare drum, chrome, deep dish probably. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, he's he's going to beat me, Herb. He's oh, a he's beast. Electric guitar. Telecaster all day. I got it, Herb. Stereo bus. Mm, mine. <laughs> <laughs> Son of a <laughs> bitch. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I called Chuck. I said, Chuck, I'm going to see Pensada. He, he's, he's, he's in Denver. I said, what you going to tell him? I said, I'm just going to throw. Oh, like, shit. I got to put this back together. I said, I'm going to throw the Phoenix at him. Oh, nice. Oh, tell Chuck, my man. <laughs> we should have Chuck on the show. Give, give Chuck should. an invite. Exactly because, Chuck uh, will love you. He, he loves you. And um, we were talking about this show because one of our friends, um, he swears by you. I mean, he comes oh, in having contests so cool. with us. Like, we were in the studio. He's like. Yo, Pensada said, we like, <laughs> before we, that's how we found out about the show. Is that right? Right, so yeah. he kept going like, Pensada said, Pensada, and he's just running around moving like, Pensada like, no, Pensada said. I'm like, do I know Pensada? Right, yeah, I got his yeah. number. I, right. think, I think Chuck is one of the two or three best engineers to have ever lived. And the funny thing about Chuck, he's a, a guy that just, no, he was I'll, an intern who came down who was like sweeping like the floors outside in the studio who never said nothing. And, one engineer just didn't come, and he just, when I was doing the way I see it, I said, I want to do this sound that sounds like Motown. I remember, remember you were and, hanging out at Enterprise. And everybody you said, no, he was like, I know what you're talking about, which I didn't believe him. Right. And then the album later, I was there. And he went in and killed it. Yeah. Wow, wow. Okay, one last one. Vo Coles. You mean just what do I like about vocals? Just the first thing that comes to your mind. The vocals, uh, Stevie the Wonder. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. He kills you. I, I, I want to go back to Chuck. Um, he really did a spectacular job on your records because to capture sounds is difficult in itself, but he be, he went beyond capturing your sound. He captured your heart, your vibe, the whole concept of the records. Kudos to him. Yeah, man, thanks. Yeah, Chuck let's, is a good dude. Let's introduce G.I. Griffin in our corner office. G.I., how are you? Pretty good. I imagine that you have a ton of questions for our guests. That is an understatement. Why don't, yes. you, why don't you fire away, sir? All right. The first one, uh, this is from Turetic and basically everyone else in the chat room. Uh, they want you to elaborate more on how you manage to sound current uh, making retro type music. Um, I think the way I did that is by, I, I, like I said, I really love music and I, I, I love to play and perform in front of people and I think I just... I just notice what's around me, and um, I know what's not good. Right. right. And I know what some kid may not like, even though I'm not paying attention to that. I always say, if you're like, listen to my records at this point, and you don't pay rent in your house, your parents are probably gonna like my record, which is gonna you're gonna end up liking it pretty soon. Right. <laughs> and that's how I grew up on music, cause you I, go. you know, music in my house, but parents are playing. So that's how I think I stay current. Well, you know mm -hmm. what? To that to that point, one of the things that it is probably obvious, but needs to be stated, is that there is a rare gift when you're a front man. You know, not everybody, there's a lot of front men who aren't that good, then there's some natural ones, and Ray has always been one of the best front men ever. You. you know, Mick Jagger's one of the best front men, and we go way back from right. starting the Mercury days, exactly. so I've seen the whole. Let, let me amplify that, Herb. I, I'm a big fan of, if the lead singer walks down in the audience, I want to be able to pick him out in the crowd. And, and a lot of particular movements, you can't tell the, the, the players from the crowd. I mean, it, it's an and you've form. always had a unique sense of fashion that complemented your, your sense of musicality. And, and, and you, you, you epitomize the classic front man in every way. And soul man. I mean, the, yeah. the thing about Ray is Ray's being Ray. Yeah, man. So I, I grew up, I, I just can pay a lot of credit to a lot of uh, gospel singers I grew up playing for. You know, in quartet, like the groups like the, the Dixie Hummingbirds or the, uh, the Mighty oh, Clouds of Joy. Wow. 
So I play behind the local groups like that. So if you're standing behind four men as a kid, like you're 10 years old and you're playing bass and they're singing and they're killing it. Yeah. That's all I say. That's all I ever seen. So uh, when it was time for me to take the mic, I was going like, well, what am I going to do? So I knew if I wasn't getting the audience or if somebody was trying to heckle me or, you know, I just like had to get past that all the time. Yeah. So that was part of my challenge, I think. That's that, no college. Could, there's no school nah, prepare you for that. Can't learn that. It's no money. Every time Gee, you I say, give us hold on. Every time you say something, you get me on another tangent. The, <laughs> the high, the high guy thing, the high parts and the mighty clouds of joy. Yeah, Paul Beasley. God, you guys look up Mighty Clouds of Joy. This guy's, his high register is as clear as any human being on yeah. earth, isn't it? Yeah. G.I., give us another one. All right, next one is from Ray Passe. Raphael, what are some of the challenges, if any, in consistently creating quality work for your own solo uh, projects or groups while still producing other artists and making your style work for them? Um, well, most artists come to me who want a little piece of what I do, and they've probably been in a business 10 years, or if they're new, they're looking for a piece, they're looking for a brand, you know, somebody to like, you know, for my brand to be on their brand for, to endorse them. So I think with me knowing that, it, it just, uh, I know why they're in the room with me and they, they must like music a little bit. So I try to like, you know, bring drums that I know this, not just current, that just sounds good. Yeah. You know, and I think that's, you know, drums run the world to me. Mm. And bass is like the other part of it. So in, in a tenor voice, it runs the other part of the world. So I feel like I have those three components. So I think that makes me consistent with everything that I do. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Mm -hmm. Next one is from Science the Producer. What's your typical inspiration when you want to create a new tune? And do you typically start with a specific instrument when you, when you begin the songwriting process? Um, sometimes I start with like, you know, I'm on a guitar. But most part, I think my inspiration starts from places like, you know, Holland Wolf, you know, I'll, I'll listen to Holland Wolf for like months. Is that right? You know, just because I like the personality. A personality influences me to, to make records. It's not an industry, it's not a label, it's not an A&R, it's none of that. It's, it's the people who, who didn't have and they made great records that people like the Stones want to record now are, are the Black Keys. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm inspired by everything before and it could go all the way to like back in the day, my, I might just hear organized noise. And it's, it's a whole bunch of musicians that you don't know that's brilliant, that you know this is going to happen. Like Kendrick is, you know, Lamar. It's like different, yeah. different things, and, you know, you grab, and it'll, like that inspires me right now. Yeah. You know, different you're, things you're, like that. You're at Columbia Records. I'm at Columbia, it, yeah. It, it, I guess Rick Rubin is, is a little easier to work for, but that must drive them crazy, not knowing what the heck they're going to get. And they all know. want to have input. But I guess Rick gives you freedom to be that way, huh? Well, Rick, uh, when I did The Way I See It, like I think Columbia was dropping people and I just got signed there. And um, he came by to see what I had. He came over and we was more or but less looking. you weren't looking. even an artist then, were you? Well, but, yeah. Well, he, you know, he, well, I wasn't on Columbia, you mean. Right. I wasn't on Columbia. Then I signed to Columbia. He got, he got the gig. That's what I remember. He came over. That's what I remember. And we just... Just Looked at it. gear. Yeah, there you go. That's respect. We had the same people make to fix my gear to fix his gear. Mm. And so then he played the record. He says, is this a sample? I'm like, no, it's drums. Mm. This is a sample? I'm like, no, it's drums. So we kind of had that conversation. I like what you're doing, continue. And that was it. And I just made my record. There you go. Good for you. That's yeah. respect. One more GI real quick. All right, last one is from Tony L84. Raphael, how is the process of creating and prepping a song for a TV commercial such as your Toyota commercial different than prepping a record for a live show? Well, it's still only like 30 seconds. Um, but I think this one, just, you know, like I said, I have a brand. I, I was more worried about like, is this going to look cheesy or sound terrible? But, you know, I just kind of put my engineer Chuck on it. I hopped on bass, grabbed my drummer, grabbed Rob Bacon and put him on guitar. And it's, it became me, but I have to give credit to like the guys who, I didn't even write the commercial. Some other guys did, and so I was really worried about it. When I heard it, I was like, I'm gonna have to change something, I know. But they, <laughs> but they sort of listened to the way I see it, and they nailed it. Wow. And so I was like, okay, I can't change anything, but I'll play everything over and make it sound exactly like me. So I think that's what I had to do. Uh, cool. I'll tell you what, uh, that commercial was great. It's, by, by the way, guys, when you see this, it's, it's, it's You'll notice it's a red Toyota Prius, and you'll see Raphael standing by it. 
And uh, shout out to Rob Bacon. The, uh, you, you only have one problem, my friend, is that we're going to be calling you back to do more of this. Can we call you back? Uh, sure, anytime. Miss. Come on, I tell him <laughs> you can call me back anytime. No question. Yeah. Ray, we are. Actually, I call Ray. Because and, of the commercial. Yeah, I, was t I wanted to congratulate him on the commercial. And uh, that's how, that all, you know, thanks to Damien Smith. <clears> that, absolutely. And, and say, say your girl's name. Ty, Ty, Tara Stenson. Ta Tara yeah, Tara. Stinson Tara. Thanks to her help, and, too. And, and as a point of personal pride, which is small stuff. Uh, Raphael's managed by somebody who used to work for me. Who used to manage me? Who used to manage you along with me and is a probably my most successful protege I was very close to. Together, you guys have done a phenomenal job. Thank you. On your career. Shout out to D. Good wait, job, wait, wait, Grasshopper. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I mean, is no, he more <laughs> was he more successful than me? I'm by a protege. Far, by far. Let's have, let's I, have a damn protege we, battle we, we here. I'll get all come, 30 of us. You have to come back to Dad. So Dad's got you hooked up here. So again, good job, D. Ray. Good job. Thank you. Thank Pleasure, you. brother. Pleasure. Thank Have you. me back. Say goodbye, my friend. Okay, Raphael, thank you so much, man. Thank you. It's, it's an inspiration being around you. Guys, the reason I have musicians on the show is if you want to be a great engineer, hang around great musicians. Uh, other engineers, you learn how to be an engineer. When you hang around great musicians, you learn music, and that's what it's all about at the end of the day. Um, I will talk to you guys again real soon. Hasta mañana.